You are listening to Live from Lord North Street, a podcast from the Institute of Economic Affairs. I'm Kate Andrews, news editor at the IEA. Today I'm speaking to one of the world's most widely decorated economists, Professor Vernon Smith, Nobel Prize winner in economics and a longtime friend of the IEA. Professor Smith gives his analysis of current economic trends in the U.S. and throughout Europe, including his take on Donald Trump's tariffs and obstacles to free trade. If you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe to our iTunes channel, IA Conversations. Vernon, back in 2002, you advised then President George W. Bush that the tariffs that he wanted to implement were a big mistake and that they would have a lot of economic damage. It's now 16 years later, and we're having to make the same arguments again. You've written in the Wall Street Journal to advise President Trump from a public platform that his tariffs on steel and aluminum are also a bad idea. Do you think the president's listening? Current President Trump is listening to that constituency, but I think is if you look at the constituency that that put him in office, a lot of those people come from old manufacturing areas within the United States, and a lot of those people feel left out in terms of the growth and development of the United States. They see a lot of the manufacturing jobs that they once had now gone overseas. And they, uh, I think they, they voted for Trump because he was not a part of the political system as they saw it. <laughs> and of course he's saying, he's saying things that they readily can relate to and understand. You know, more than anything, a politician needs votes. He needs to communicate with people at a level that they understand. And those jobs have gone overseas, and he's going to stop that. <laughs> but is he going to stop that? Are his no. tariffs going to be successful? No, I don't think so. And and I think the problem will be the same problem that President Bush ran into. He tried to put on a steel tariff, and there was worldwide retaliation. Other countries coming back and said, well, if you're going to put a tariff on steel, we're going to put a tariff on your exports to us. And so he had to back down. I mean, it wasn't feasible politically to, uh, to move ahead. And I remember at the time he said, well, you know, uh, Vernon, he says, you handle the economics and I'll handle the politics. And, and I think that was actually fairly wise because none of the damage followed, and yet he got credit with the steel industry for, for supporting them. For say. looking and tough. So he could tell them, well, you know, I did my best, but it's just, we can't do it. It's, too, there's, it's going to cause more harm than, than benefit. Is there a problem, however, whether it be George W. Bush or Donald J. Trump, with trying to look tough on this issue, trying to suggest that tariffs have economic benefits for the home country, because we know that in reality, tariffs hurt consumers at home as much as they may hurt uh, the countries where the tariffs are being put upon. Yes, but the thing is, you put a tariff on a particular commodity, like uh, importation of steel, protect the steel industry, that industry is, is very visible, and all the people that work with it work there, you see, are very visible. And it may have the effect of reducing many of our different exports, but that's more dispersed among mm. more industries and more people. So you see, the, even though on, on balance, everybody's going to be better off without the tariff, it's the more uh, concentrated interest that you see that, gets, uh, that, that, that is speaking there. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's always the problem. The particular industry and, and the benefits that are seen for that industry, if you put on a tariff, are more visible than the costs to everybody else. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, that's why you get mileage out of these, these arguments. But, but I think you see what is going to happen, and, and in fact it's already happened, and it happened before, and you can assure that it will happen, is that uh, countries retaliate, and the question is whether you, how much of that retaliatory cost are you willing to bear in order to support this particular industry, or Harley-Davidson, whatever the industry might be. 
Mm. Yes. Uh, recently, Harley Davidson said that they were going to start putting more investment into their production plants abroad, uh, which means more jobs in those plants abroad. Um, it means more coming out of, of those areas and, and, and less coming out of the states. I mean, how can Donald Trump claim that this is making America great again? He's got this image that he can go back to a period, you see, before we started losing that business. It's true that we have on on current account, uh, we have a trade imbalance, but the flows are nevertheless balanced. That means that people that are importing goods into the U.S. dollars are receiving dollars for that, and so those dollars eventually have to come back and buy something. Now, what's happening is some of those dollars are coming back and they're being invested. I mean, they may be buying treasury bills or, I mean, government securities, and they may be investing in, you know, and other products within, within the United States. So the, the dollars all come back. <laughs> mm-hmm. The president spends a lot of time talking about how jobs have been lost in America to migrants and people who are willing to do jobs for a lower salary. But it seems that a lot of the jobs that he's trying to target, especially manufacturing, have very little to do with immigration and much more to do with issues of automation. The loss of jobs in these areas doesn't go back just a few years. It can go back decades. Uh, so, you know, is there anything the president really can do to help these industries in the long term? If anything, that will bring a lot of that manufacturing back to the United States because we do have our advantage. We have no, we're not disadvantaged in any way in the U.S. Uh, in that connection. In fact, many of those that those products are coming back to the U.S., but it's not showing up in the form of manufacturing jobs because, you see, if you, if you use very little uh, labor input, then then there's no advantage in, in locating in China where wages are low because you're not you're substituting machines for those for those mm. workers anyway. So a lot of this it will will come back. And uh, with with automation, the, the point, is, the real point is that people have to be prepared to change their their careers. You know, I tell young people today that in the, or studying, I said be 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 prepared for about three career changes during your life because we live in a world of change, and you can't. Whatever you're, you're doing now for a living, you can't be assured that that's going to continue for your whole life. And, and you have to be, be flexible. A lot of people are clearly intimidated and worried about this change, understandably so. But it seems to be translating, politically anyway, into a real rise in economic nationalism, both in the U.S. and also in the U.K. and on mainland Europe. Are you concerned about this? Oh, yes, I am. I think the nationalistic component is, you know, that's sort of scary. We have been there before. That is not as if, you know, in periods of where uh, there's some sort of uh, threats to our national position. For, uh, you saw this in the First World War. When we entered the First World War, there was a lot of resistance to that and people that opposed us entering that First World War, the, co- the so- so-called Great War, and then, then when the Second World War came around, why, it was even greater, so they had to change the name. That's when we got the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918, that uh, you could be prosecuted for saying, for criticizing the flag, the military, the, uh, the, the country and its leadership. So that free speech always suffers in, in, in those, those times. Now, the Sedition Act in 1918 was so bad that Congress itself repealed that in, in less than three years because there were, there were something like 2,000 cases of people being prosecuted. But, but, it was, but it was times sort of like this, you see. The, the threat was, was different, and, but there was this nationalistic... Uh, move that put us into the First World War after there was sort of a re- there was a revulsion to that war because the carnage so many young men lost their lives and and we'd had all of these o- over a hundred years we had not been involved in European conflicts and 
And uh, so there was a revulsion to that episode of the First World War, which made it all the more different for, difficult for Roosevelt when it was the rise of Hitler, who w w was kind of a different, in, in a completely different category. <laughs> An extremely necessary yeah. war. But, mm -hmm. but, these, but these periods, they, uh, uh, during the Cold War, uh, the McCarthy-Nixon period, where there was uh, concern about communist infiltration of our institutions and government. And so there was kind of a, a lot of, of American citizens were suspected of, if they had any kind of left uh, leanings at some time in their life, then they were often uh, the target of this uh, crusade against, uh, against uh, the communist conspiracy. And and I went through that. It was very, it was it was pretty, you know, very distinguished people like J. Robert Oppenheimer, the the great physicist, who very probably did flirt with left wing politics as a young man. That's not at all unusual. He had been involved in the creation of the the atomic bomb. He was very much concerned to. He was opposed to having a hydrogen bomb and expanding that, so he he was on the side of the sort of the peace forces at the time, and and he was suspected of being a communist spy. So the 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 current times are very similar to some of these past times. How do we overcome it? How does free enterprise win the day again? Well, it's what there is grounds for optimism because. First Amendment rights and free enterprise has managed to always survive these periods and continue and to grow. So that uh, my, I think in the long term, you see that's where the that's where the wealth is. That's where that's the way that's the that's the route to a better life. You see, is more freedom in our social, political, and economic uh, affairs and. <clears throat> And, you know, we have nice, um, Korea is a nice controlled experiment, almost natural experiment. North Korea and South Koreans all have the same history and, and the same experience, the same language and everything, but they've been split now. And, and the North has far less, very little freedom, and the South lots more freedom, and the South is a, an engine of, of production. Mm. You know, they're burying us in automobiles and cameras, and I don't know what else they produce. It is a very stark contrast, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, so how should those who support free enterprise, who support freedom, um, who, who, you know, fundamentally believe in, in liberty, how should we treat not just the age of Donald Trump, but also the increasing tendency of political parties across the spectrum to be more populist, more nationalist, and more closed-minded. It's not just the Republicans under Trump. The Democrats as well have Senator mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders, you know, who once said that he thought bread lines were the sign of a healthy country. Here in the UK, you have Jeremy Corbyn's Labor Party, which is preaching the politics of the 1970s, renationalizing every industry under the sun. Um, even the Conservative Party in the UK is proposing energy price caps uh, and significantly more government spending that it obviously cannot afford. Hmm. So, you know, how, how do we deal with this? What are the arguments we need to be making? How do you deal with this politically? You know, what's our role? Well, I think you need to emphasize that uh, all of these things have been tried in the past and they don't work, you see. And in the extreme, you have countries like uh, North Korea and Venezuela, where the country, they can't even feed their own people. And, of course, in Ven Venezuela, as the largest oil reserves of any country in the world, well, but they don't know how to manage and run the oil industry. They seized the oil companies. They nationalized them. And It's absolutely and, tragic. They're, yes. they're so resource-rich. There's yes. no reason that country should be in any state of poverty. But the point is that uh, government is not any good for managing uh, enterprises, nothing like the private sector, and it should just be left alone. Now, New Zealand was one of the first democratic socialist countries, and, and it was, you know, at the time, beginning in, in the late 1930s, and many felt that was the way to go, that democracy was 
a, a socialist democracy would work. Well, they came out of the Second World War with the third highest per capita income in the world, and and you know, by, by 1980, they had a foreign exchange crisis. The country was bankrupt, you see. They had more and more uh, interfered with the economy and, and lost all of their, uh, their advantages in agricultural products. You know, a small country uh, uh, dependent upon world trade cannot make so <laughs> is the least likely country to make socialism work, you see. If people would just ask themselves, why is it that we tend to be better off than our parents and they were better off than our grandparents and so forth? Where is all this coming from? And and you see it particularly in kind of the uh, countries. It, it, it began in Northern Europe and the United Kingdom, uh, you know, in the 18th century, and it has spread that those the rule of law and and free institutions, social, political, and economic institutions have spread west into the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia. Those and those those are the countries that are producing the wealth, and then and then eventually it. You see, China and India even are affected by that. And you have China uh, doing very well, and, and they've basically liberalized their, their, all of their international markets. Within the country, it's still a lot of state-run mm -hmm. enterprises. And, and, of course, human rights are a problem still in China. But China is experiencing, you see, the value of, of freer involvement in other countries in trade and it's going to be in the long term that's what will make us make us uh, uh, better off so that I you know I think to me it's we, we focus on this these short-run things because that's what's in the newspapers on TV and radio and it's one crisis after another and we don't see this betterment that's going on across generations and I think with regard to Trump, I tell people in the United States, when the, any policy that's good, uh, favor it. If, it. if it's not good, oppose it. I mean, deal with him on a, don't worry about the general issues, D deal with each of these cases as they come up and, and support him when he's right, oppose him when, when he's wrong. And he has made some good appointments. Vernon, speaking of experiments, we're so happy today to be joined by a Nobel Memorial Prize winner in the economic sciences. And you won that for having pioneered the use of laboratory experiments as a tool in imperial economic analysis. So just to finish up, when you're looking at the world today and you're analyzing, especially from an economic perspective, what's happening, from a Nobel Prize winner to the rest of us, what's the best piece of advice you have for analyzing the economic world that we're living in right now? The secret is freedom and free choice. Uh, it is an engine, you see, for the creation of human uh, economic betterment as well as, as, well as social and, and uh, political betterment. The, the world, you see, in the last 200 years has just moved marvelously toward a greater creation of wealth per capita. And even the poorest areas you see, have 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 done have done better in that world, and keep the focus on that, and not run these short one these short run issues and problems. Then remember and keep in mind that uh, politicians get votes by telling you the bad news and make you, making you afraid and and telling you that more things uh, that it, that it could get worse if. Something is not done. Well, every age has these kind of politicians, and and I've seen them many times in my lifetime. You know, I've I've lived nine decades, and you get to see a lot of bad things as well as a huge number of good. You know, I often tell people the most wonderful thing that happened to me was I was born in a free country with parents who had an eighth grade education, but I was free to uh, to take advantage of opportunities and change and. Uh, 
was I was most fortunate to have had, to have been born in that kind of a world. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. For more blogs, podcasts, films, and reports, visit our website at iea.org.uk.